Okay. Um, I went to wake up my daughter and she um, isn't it doesn't look like she's bleeding and she's got food coming out of her mouth. Um, she's got to do this. Okay. She flew all over. Okay. Hold on. Evening. This is the, the gravity of the situation we're talking about tonight. My name is uh, Andrew Jones, and I'm the Family Ministry Director at Stillwaters Church in Jackson. And it's an honor to be here to represent the faith community as we hope to, to partner uh, in the fight against opioid addiction in Washington County. Welcome to Is It Really Here? Where we will hear from families who've lost, who have lost a loved one and law enforcement about the current status of the heroin epidemic. Tonight is the first in a five-part lecture series to educate parents and other adults in the community about the dangers of opioid addiction in Washington County. This is a cooperative effort of the West Bend Rotary Club, Elevate, Moraine Park Technical College, and the Washington County Heroin Task Force. This series is designed to complement the Hidden in Plain Sight exhibit, which we encourage you to visit later this evening if you haven't already. More details on the additional lectures in the series and the Hidden in Plain Sight exhibit at the conclusion of the evening. At this time, it's my privilege to introduce our first speaker, Mark Setti. Mark is a detective with the Washington County Sheriff's Office. He is currently assigned to the Washington County Drug Task Force. Mark has been a law enforcement officer for 26 years and has served as a detective since 2002. The Washington County Drug Task Force is, re is represented by all of the law enforcement agencies in Washington County. They work collaboratively targeting individuals involved in the production and distribution of illegal drugs and illegal prescription diversion in the county. And without any uh, further ado, Mark Setti. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, my first comments about any sort of an event like this is that the microphone is too loud and all scratchy. Is that better? All right. Um, this has to be a community effort. The drug problem, the opiate problem that's going on in all of our communities is not going to solve itself. We're not going to prevent our way out of it. We're not going to arrest our way out of it. Um, we're not going to treat our way out of it. No one uh, avenue is going to solve the problem. We have to work together, we have to work collaboratively in order to try to get a handle on what's going on. And forums like tonight, what the uh, task force is doing, uh, the, the Elevate task force, um, and the community coming together as a whole is, is what is needed to try to solve this problem. Um, you're gonna hear me talk probably more than you want, um, so I'm gonna start this off with a video um, that I like to play because I think it um, does a good job of kind of showing how these problems begin um, and why these things are going on in our community. So without further ado, I'll play that. It's about 10 or 12 minutes long, and then you'll be able to hear me uh, ramble on more than you want after that. People think it's all a joke until you're in this kind of situation, which I wake up every day with serious written all over me. I'm just now getting at that age where, you know, I have friends that are doing drugs and because of what happened to my brother, I just know the consequences aren't worth it. If you are with a negative and you are not strong enough in your own self, you will be brought down with them and you won't even know it and you'll defend yourself, you'll justify yourself. Oh, nothing's wrong with me, I'm not changing. But you do and when that happens, your mentality changes. just a normal guy. I just work, go to school, and just, just be dedicated. When I got to high school, all my friendships just kind of fell apart, and they were all totally different than I've been used to my whole life. I've dealt with drugs all my life. You know, both my parents are addicts, you know, so for me, it was like, you know, it was just the lifestyle. I have an older brother who struggled with heroin use. I worry about finding like going home one day and just finding my mom dead. It's all a bunch of messed up stuff. Been, I've been shot, stabbed, all kinds. My dad got addicted to pills, and that 
has been the story ever since. It wasn't until he overdosed that I actually even realized that my dad had alcohol problems, drug problems for my whole life. There's a lot of hurt, pain, uh, regret, stuff that overwhelms people. At first, it's a really easy choice. You can say yes or no. Well, I started like eating nerve pills and stuff like after my parents divorced and stuff. I was experimenting with drugs because of my temporary problems, which I really don't find temporary. You know, it really messed my head up. Why did I start smoking? Oh, I mean, it's just one of those times when your friends just like, you know, it's like, it was peer pressure, man. It's just like, huh, man, you, you here, you might as well, we about to teach you whatever. It seems like really rational, like, when you do it. Like you're like the exception to like, becoming addicted. Like you're like, oh, I'm just gonna take this you know, and it'll be fine, and I'm not gonna become addicted, but that's, you know, what if everyone thinks that before they take this? Like, not just to get a higher buzz, just to see, and that's how I got on everything, just curiosity. I hung around the cool kids, man, that's what I thought. You know, I thought I was the one with the big dogs. I was doing what they were doing, I was smoking what they were smoking, I was drinking what they were drinking, just like on the music videos when I was little. And just curiosity, just, you know, what it was like, you know, and everybody else was doing it, so, you know, of course, you know. It's by choice, and yeah, it might be they would just want something stronger, but it's still their choice, and they can still say no. Oh, my grades suck. I became that C minus to C student. It's hard to concentrate when you're an addict, because you just want a fix, it's, that's it. And I was always had a negative attitude about stuff, like, this, blah, blah, blah. Whenever he starts hanging out with his friends, it's like he becomes a completely different person. And he doesn't care about me or my brothers. Your brain will adapt to it. And so again, it gets that first dose. You get high. Um, it, it enjoys it, and it, but it says, OK, now I'm ready for that the second time. But I'm really, I'm, I'm prepared for it. So now, to maybe to get that same high or take, have your brain take that break, it needs more again and, and it just keeps building on it on itself i guess it really began with him like smoking pot and drinking well i started you know just you know like how any other kid they usually they start smoking pot and then you know it turned into i started taking nerve pills all the time and then it was you know adderall and then i started doing pain pills and then pain pills wasn't enough so that's when i started using heroin those things were sort of the starting point for him and it just progressed from there you know i started getting into pills after marijuana, you know, drinking in school, getting drunk. There's a view that pills are clean and heroin's dirty, and and take it for what you will, pills are just as bad. What got me hooked on heroin's first line, and I was smoked a joint before and it was already really high, because it was some chronic, and I was like, I couldn't get any more higher. Snorted a line of heroin and felt amazing, like the best I've ever felt in my life and nothing could ever replace that first feeling I had, and I kept wanting to f get that every day. Just feel invincible, no problems, nothing to think about. Just feel invincible, and it screwed me over. Your body gets so immune to different things, it's like levels. And once you get so much of marijuana, you're gonna want more and more and more and more to smoke just to get that high you got the first time. Same with cocaine. Start off with little lines of cocaine and turn into huge lines of cocaine, thick lines. I didn't know that he was using heroin until he overdosed the first time. I really don't know how to explain it. You want it every day, all day, and you try to get it every day, all day, just to get that one feeling, but you'll never have it, ever. And there's a point where you're just so high up there that, you know, you just gotta do it just to even feel normal for the day. Like, you don't even, you don't get high no more. You're just normal. It's like to have to live a normal life, and it's awful. <laughs> Where heroin acts, it's an area that 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 needs to be fed. Once it gets one, it constantly needs to be fed, and 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 when you take it away and it's not getting that anymore, and it depends on it, it's it's gonna it's gonna cause your body to do anything it can to go to go get that substance back. So it, it makes you feel sick, and these people really get sick when they stop using. Eventually, it's you don't use it, you're dope sick. You're on the ground, crunching up, puking because you don't have it. Oh, it's awful. I mean, you know, it's like, um, you get like the hot and cold sweats, and then, um, you know, you're puking, you know, just feeling that urge, you get pains, like, in your legs, and your arms, and your back, 
your head's pounding, you can't sleep, you can't eat. It's terrible. It's like the worst feeling in the world. And like, I, when I look back, you know, now from this, like I think it's like, why did I let myself be like that? So heroin, it's, it's fancy talk as an opioid. So it's kind of, it's a drug that is meant to slow things down. And what happens in an overdose is people will take it. Um, it will, it, it will hit all those spots and it'll hit them very hard, you know, with either a lot or a very potent dose. And, and in an overdose, it will then, you know, the body will just stop responding. It will stop breathing. So rather than slow it down, it'll stop it all together. I just, I knew I was dying. I was slowly killing myself. I OD'd a couple of times and that really like changed me, knowing that you were on that bed dead and having to come back to life. He overdosed a second time and it was a lot worse. And he suffered um, severe brain damage from it. And he got arrested. And I remember like the feeling of like a relief, like that like I really wasn't bothered by him getting arrested. I was just happy that he wasn't dead. You want to stay high because you don't want to think of the problems. But you're going to have to deal with the problems or you're not going to go anywhere. And if you keep getting high, you're going to be in the same situation you were stuck in six years ago. And then you're all alone in the end. All alone, broke, and probably in jail. Just try to kick your door in. <laughs> Take you to jail, pretty much. It's awful. It's a, it was the worst experience of my life. You know, my decision was, I'm going to get high and not think about it. I'll deal with it later, which I'm dealing with it later. If you're looking up to people like that who do drugs and all that type of stuff, like, if you think that's cool, like, you got to be young-minded because in reality, drugs don't, Drugs don't get you far. They gonna get you in a casket or locked up in prison. I don't understand how um, not knowing where you're at is cool. Not knowing who you slept with the night before is cool. You do have a choice and, 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 and it's an important choice, again, because you will lose your ability to, to make your own choices once you start down that road. I've just seen the horrors of heroin use. And that's just not something I would ever be inclined to try or be around anyone who is doing it. Drugs have not helped me. I never ever would have thought I would have been an addict. It's, it's a horrible life to go down for real. I wish I never did. You're going to be curious. It's natural to be curious. But there are big consequences here when you explore and when you, when you start exploring with this stuff. There, there are some major, major consequences. Like saying, just say no, do that because it works and it will help you out in the long run. Like, am I gonna try this and get addicted to it? I don't know. Am I gonna try this and not get addicted? I don't know. So, I mean, really with trying any drug, it's a risk. Find things that make you happy. Find good people in your life and then you won't need something to fill that void in your life because it's never worth it. It won't ever be worth it. You know, the outcome is most likely going to be a lot more negative than positive, inevitably. You don't have to look just like everyone else, and you don't have to do what everyone else is doing. Stay in something as positive as you can. If you want to get up and you want to go to school, then you're going to get up and go to school. If you want to get good grades and you want to go to college, you're going to go. You'll find a way. But if you, if you want to sit at home and you want to sleep all day and you want to feel sorry for yourself, then that's what you're going to do. So I guess that I had to change my want to. There are mistakes where even an entire lifetime is not going to be enough to really fix it. You don't have to be where you came from. It's all part of what you want and what you, who you want to be. I think stick with school and getting good grades and actually becoming something of yourself. Not doing all this stuff and going down. Just don't mess with any drugs or anything that could threaten 
um, the, uh, the way you live your life. You have so much potential. You can do anything, you know. You could be anything you want to be, you know. So why lose all that, you know? Why, you know, just throw that all away just for a buzz? It's not worth it at all, at all. <laughs> Never met a perfect, like, person with, that's doing good for their self on heroin. Never met it. All right, folks, um, like I said, I like to start with because it really highlights, I think, how this problem is happening. A lot of people ask me, why does this happen? Where does it All of these kids, if you listen, essentially had this story. They started drinking, they started smoking weed, moved on to the next pill, they moved on to the next harder drug. Eventually, we ended up with an opiate problem. This series was filmed in the Indianapolis area well been just change the faces the story is always this I talk to a lot of people choose and I hear this over and over and over um, I saw this time and microphone I'm sorry about that I saw this the first time and or I looked at this and said well it's what I've been saying for a while it's just a with music set to it um, so I'll run through this. Time. I hit on this one to begin with uh, at all the presentations that I do to highlight the fact it's not just is fighting to solve the problem in the community. We are represented by all the law enforcement organizations throughout the uh, physically that's where we operate. There are being support to the drug task force. Justin um, Klopp is here tonight. When available, better. Um, and the other agencies that don't have somebody assigned yes. up there um, working in the unit provide support in other ways. For example, Hartford uh, Police has a canine uh, that we utilize quite a bit. Other agencies uh, provide support financially as well. So it's not just us. So what are the drug trends that are going on in Washington County? Well, marijuana is still a giant player. Always has been and it probably always will be. Um, this is not a how-to class or uh, intended to be a business that you might want to start, but the money is still in marijuana. Um, with rare exception, the opiates, um, there's not really a lot of money in that for the people that are selling. Particularly in our community, it's uh, more of a user community. A lot of people that are selling heroin in our community are probably supporting their own habit, uh, more so than making a lot of money. But the money is still in marijuana. Um, we're having a lot of uh, shipments from source states where it has become legalized. It comes here um, and it's sold on the street. This was a search warrant we did a little while ago, and for those... Um, you know, you'll see some things that I, I highlight in the picture here. Um, this AR-15 rifle was loaded and ready to go and was right next to the multiple pounds of marijuana uh, that, were, that you see there. Um, uh, the cash, which was located in the linen closet right off the room where this uh, marijuana was located, there was about $10,000 cash underneath the towel. That's where I keep my cash. I don't know about you all. Um, that's a lot of money. And these people have a lot of interest to protect. Um, both of these guns that you see in the picture were loaded and ready to go. Um, High-grade marijuana, uh, those are pounds, probably selling for about $4,000 a pound in this community, um, if, depending on what quantities it's sold in. Um, another loaded pistol, so you can see where the money is. Uh, and that's why one of the large reasons that marijuana continues to be a giant issue. Um, dabbing. You see the terms at the top, shatter, wax, BHO, they're all kind of intercha interchangeable terms for what is highly concentrated THC. What they do through a chemical process is they, um, they will strip the THC 
off of the plant material. Um, when it comes out, it's very highly concentrated. So this product that you see at the top, uh, the shatter, or the sides, shatter is, it looks like peanut brittle, and they call it shatter because it will actually break. The other ones are more flexible. In the end, it's the same product. It's just the manufacturing process. The end, the end product comes out a little bit differently. But these products are about uh, probably 90% pure THC compared to um, marijuana that is regu regular marijuana that is smoked. Uh, good marijuana is probably 25%. So this stuff is incredibly highly concentrated, um, and people are overdosing on this as well, generally not fatally, but um, some problems are coming up as a result of this. Um, so... Um, the number 420 is oftentimes associated with people that are involved with marijuana because 420, um, a long time ago, a lot of people uh, would smoke marijuana at 420 in the afternoon. Of course, now April 20th is National Marijuana Smoking Day. Um, so if you see somebody that has these numbers written around, scribbled on notebooks, things like that, it might be a clue that somebody is involved with marijuana or at least interested in it. And then... The next number, um, again, with the, with the uh, THC oil or the wax, the 710 turned upside down is oil, so you'll start to see that as well, some things that you might want to look for if you suspect that somebody is involved with marijuana or the concentrated marijuana. And then that glass rig up there, that's, uh, that's required to, to smoke the concentrated marijuana, and we're seeing quite a bit of this now in the county. Um, it's much more concealable. Um, it doesn't really smell as much as regular marijuana, um, and it just takes a very small dab, thus the term dabbing, um, for people to get really high uh, from smoking it. This is some concentrated stuff that we recently took off the streets. Um, and it's packaged uh, generally in some sort of a parchment paper or wax paper because it is it tends to be a little bit sticky. Um, and so you'll see it packaged like that. And when it's folded up, it's very small, um, easily concealable. Um, again, this is not a how-to class, but again, the process in making this stuff, uh, to the concentrated stuff, is they will pack a, a tube like that full of um, plant material, uh, marijuana, and then they'll typically run butane over it, and there's a one-way valve at the bottom. It drips out. There's more of a process to get to the finished product, but this is how they're doing it. Anybody in the room see the problem that could come up here? Some of you have seen this uh, presentation before, so you know, but those who haven't, I heard... Fire, yes, um, or more importantly, an explosion. Um, a lot of homes have been blown right off the foundation doing this, um, and we actually became involved in this case because the individual that was doing this, something blew up. So it's very dangerous. Tetrahydrocannabinoid. Um, uh, BHO stands for butane honey oil. Again, uh, in, order, in making this product, they're going to put the plant material in that tube and they're going to run butane over it, um, and then you get an oily product out of it. So it's butane honey oil or shatter or wax. It's kind of the same thing. It's just the finished product will look a little bit differently. Uh, marijuana edibles are becoming a little bit more popular um, as they are shipped in from out of state and source states. So uh, THC and um, the, the active ingredient in marijuana is in some of these drinks or candies, um, so we're starting to see that quite a bit as well. All right, um, as we move on to other what we call common drugs, um, there's a lot of drugs around. When I say common, I'm talking about the things that we typically see here in Washington County more so than some of the other things. Um, cocaine is around, uh, that was around uh, quite a bit a number of years ago. It's starting to make a comeback. We're starting to see quite a bit more crack cocaine uh, in the area again. Uh, LSD. Mushrooms, we've uh, had some cases with those in the past couple of years. Not a ton of them, but enough to, to put it on our radar. Um, and along with those, we're also starting to see a lot of uh, synthetic, um, man-made chemicals that mimic the same effects of some of these things, particularly the LSD um, and the ecstasy. Prescription pills is uh, a discussion in and of itself because there's so many and so many variants and so many different prescription pills that are bought and sold on the street and diverted, as we call it. Um, some of the more common ones that we see bought and sold illegally, oxycodone, Xanax, Ritalin, and so the amphetamines, and some of the other ones. The scheduled drugs, the, the narcotic pills, are what we see uh, more often than not being bought and sold on the street. Um, K2 and bath salts, we heard a lot about these things a couple of years ago. K2 was the, they called it synthetic marijuana. It isn't exactly, but um, we'll go with that for now. Um, it's uh, basically uh, like potpourri with a chemical sprayed on it, and when you smoke it, it has the same 
physiological effect on the body as smoking marijuana. This was in almost every gas station in Washington County for a while because it wasn't illegal because the chemicals in it weren't illegal. They have since become illegal, and so these things have typically fallen out of favor. We see them a little bit, but not too much. Um, and the bath salts was something that was in the news a lot as well, which is essentially synthetic methamphetamine, same type of thing. We weren't having a big problem with this in the area, but they were in, in southern states quite a bit more. And speaking of methamphetamines, I did unfortunately have to recently change this slide. It used to say we really don't have much of a methamphetamine problem here in Washington County. Unfortunately, in lieu of that, we have a heroin or an opiate problem. However, methamphetamines are starting to show up in the area, and we're starting to see it more and more frequently. So I am concerned with what's coming. This is some methamphetamine that we just took off the street a week and a half ago. Um, you can see it uh, looks, they, sometimes they call it crystal meth, they, sometimes they call it ice because it has a crystally appearance to it. Um, it's hard, um, and this is two and a half grams, and this is, this is nasty stuff, and we don't need this problem in the community as well, but I do fear that it's coming. So do we have a heroin problem? The clear answer is yes. I think we all know that. That's why we're here. But in these presentations, what I like to really drive home the point is that what we really have is an opiate problem. We talk about the heroin problem because heroin is the, for lack of a better term, the yucky drug. It's the drug that involves the needles. It's the street drug. Um, but we have an opiate problem with narcotic pills as well. So we have a prescription diversion problem that is just as bad as the, as the heroin problem because these products, if you're unaware, are essentially the same. Oxycodone is a synthetic version of heroin. So what is heroin? It was kind of answered in, in the previous video. But heroin is uh, naturally occurring and is derived from the poppy plant. All heroin begins its life as morphine. You can't have heroin without morphine. All right? So morphine is used medically in the United States. Heroin is not. I don't pretend to know why. I'm not a doctor. I just play one on TV. Um, but heroin is used medically in some other countries. They are very, very close chemical cousins. And as a matter of fact, when we, um, if we have an overdose death and, and, and a blood sample is taken, we never get a result back that says the person has heroin in their system. They have what's called 6-monoacetylmorphine because the body synthesizes heroin back into a morphine product. That's how closely related the two are. So when we are talking about the other drugs that we might be familiar with, such as uh, codeine, morphine, things like that, they are very, very close chemical cousins to heroin, and these products are out there uh, in a, a large form. So that's why I like to drive home the point that we have an opiate problem, not just a heroin problem. But it's, easier, it's easier to talk about the heroin problem. So this is what street heroin looks like. I show this slide to show kind of what it looks like and how it is commonly packaged. This isn't the only way. Um, but it's frequently um, put into a, a tin foil bindle. And these bindles are very, very small in the folded up version. A lot of times when they're bought and sold on the street, they're not much bigger than the size of your fingernail. And they're very thin. They're very easily concealable. Or they're in a, or a plastic corner tie. They'll shake the drugs down into the corner of a plastic bag. They'll tie it off and they'll tear it. And you'll get what's, uh, what you see in the the plastic bag version. So if you have somebody or you suspect that somebody is involved with heroin, um, you're probably going to see that a lot of these uh, scraps of tinfoil may be in the garbage can, maybe behind a dresser, maybe on the floor of somebody's car, or these tiny little scraps of uh, plastic baggies around. Um, if they're using, it might be uh, something that might clue you in that uh, that type of a problem is going on. The other things that you're going to find if somebody is injecting heroin, and typically it's either injected or snorted, it can be smoked, but most people that I talk to are injecting or snorting. If they're injecting, you're going to have uh, what we call a heroin rig, usually some sort of a, uh, this is a sunglasses case um, that has needles in it, uh, cooking tin, um, cotton balls, syringes, things like that. Uh, the, the tools that they need in order to get the heroin into a liquefied form so they can get it into a, a syringe and inject it. So these are the types of things that you might see together if somebody is actively using and they're injecting. Um, the, the warning signs, if, if you suspect that somebody is involved with, with um, opiates, um, you know, the typical things that you might expect, somebody that is doing very well in school or in a career and all of a sudden they lose interest, 
Um, they're withdrawn. They have secretive behavior. Um, people that are involved with this type of stuff are generally not going to come out and say, I have a, an opiate problem. They're going to be secretive. They're going to be hiding away, um, doing their drugs in off-away off places. Um, aggressive behavior, you heard in the video, people when they're, when they're um, in, in withdrawal, they get very sick. Um, when we come across people that are kind of in need of a fix, they tend to be a little bit more aggressive. They want to fight a little bit more. Um, and then, of course, missing property is a big red flag because it's difficult to maintain uh, an opiate habit without financial resources. And so people that are involved in this thing, these things oftentimes turn to crimes to support their habit. Some other things um, that is unfortunate to see, I used to have to uh, get these pictures online, uh, but unfortunately these are now just photos from our jail, booking photos of people that are involved uh, with heroin and opiates. They typically are not so in they tend not to be so concerned about their hygiene. They're much more in, in concerned about when they're going to get their next fix, just like you heard on, in the videos. So over a period of time, this young lady, um, uh, you can see some of the downfalls uh, as she continues on with her addiction. This young lady as well has continued to struggle, um, and we see that, that the, the drug addiction does, isn't pleasant in, to how it handles against the body. So why don't they just quit? Again, this was kind of uh, addressed a little bit in the video. Um, when, you, when you have a, an opiate addiction, it literally changes the chemical makeup of your brain. Your brain makes uh, dopamine and other uh, things that it needs to, to regulate. When you start introducing some of these other substances, what happens is your, your body stops making those substances because it's getting it artificially. And then... When, you, when you're not getting it anymore, the body craves it and craves it and craves it and craves it even more because you're, you're giving it unnaturally. Um, and then eventually what happens is, like the video again said, people no longer use to get high. They use so they don't feel sick anymore. If you talk to somebody that has a significant opiate addiction, they will tell you that the withdrawals are like the flu, the worst flu they've ever had, times 10. And they don't want to go through that withdrawal anymore. And how does it begin? Again, oftentimes through a, a, a lifestyle of polydrug use. I'm uh, not saying that everybody that uh, takes a drink or smokes marijuana is automatically going to become addicted to uh, opiates, but that is oftentimes the path that people go down. Um, once again, they start with the, the, what I'll call the lighter drugs, and they move higher, higher and higher and higher up the scale until they have an opiate addiction. And the other one that happens, not as commonly, but certainly does, um, somebody gets a valid prescription for a, a, a true medical need for an opiate, um, and they're on it for a long time, and they have trouble getting away from it. And these are some of the types of things that we see that are prescribed that people can get addicted to. Fentanyl, Oxycontin, um, Percocet, and some of the others that show up on the list here that you may be familiar with, you may have been prescribed on your own. How are we doing on time? Move it along? All right, very good. Um, so uh, with the prescription drugs, the, the, the drug that you see on the top is a 30 milligram oxycodone tablet um, that we are typically in this area paying a dollar a milligram for. People that have these addictions oftentimes are doing multiple a day, so you can see that adds up very quickly and gets very expensive. Once again, heroin and oxy are essentially the same animal in, in terms of the way that they react with the body. If you can get a, bit of, a bindle of heroin for 10 or $20 and get the same high, it's going to last you a lot longer, and that's where these addictions typically uh, begin. Where are you going from here? If you're lucky, you'll go to jail. I don't say that in vain or to be snarky. Um, I've lost count of the calls that I have gotten from parents that say, please, please don't let my son or daughter out of jail today. I don't want them there, but at least I know they're going to live through the night. Uh, some of the penalties that happen, um, simple possession of heroin or a Schedule II narcotic is a three-and-a-half-year felony in Wisconsin. Delivery is a minimum of a 10-year felony if you deliver it to somebody. And it does actually happen. These are examples of some individuals that uh, have unfortunately been down this path. Um, and this is a, a young man in the West Bend area that has continued to struggle with some of these issues. Um, this is another one uh, from the Allenton area where these two were involved in a very significant uh, heroin operation. 
Um, and they and in this case, these people did have some assets as a result of their uh, their illegal activities um, as well. I'm going to skip through some of these pretty quickly because we're running out of time here. Um, but again, there is a huge um, connection between the crime that goes on in the community and some of these addiction problems because, once again, when you can't afford it on your own, a lot of times people are stealing, whether it's from family or friends um, or moving up to other uh, larger crimes that happen, and we see it in the news all the time. Um, this is an incident that happened at Culver's and Jackson a while ago where an opiate-addicted person came in with a gun to rob the place. Um, the police were called, and it ended up to be a bad day for everybody involved. And again, this was uh, driven by an opiate addiction um, where firearms involved uh, and things like that. People that are high are driving on the roadways. This was another case that we investigated out near the airport on Highway 33 where the driver of that black SUV was high on opiates, crossed the center line and hit the person in the, the innocent person in the silver car. Miraculously, nobody was killed in this accident. I don't know how, but the people in the silver car do have a lifetime of injuries to deal with. Um, and uh, I'm not saying that people that are addicted to opiates are uh, intentionally killing people. However, if you do deliver a drug to somebody and that person ends, ends up overdosing and dying, you can be charged with second-degree reckless homicide, as this individual was. Um, ben Stibbe, he's a gentleman from Grafton that uh, went down that path. Cool. We already saw this 911 call, um, and that's the unfortunate um, ultimate end to a lot of people that are involved with these types of things, and it's very sad. So, um, It can happen to anybody. The drug doesn't care who you are. It doesn't care what you look like. It doesn't care how rich you are, how poor, how poor, excuse me, how poor you are, what your age is. If you give it a chance, it will take you over if you can. If you are struggling with an addiction on your own, please reach out and get help. If you suspect that somebody has an addiction, reach out to them um, because this problem is not going to solve, uh, solve itself on its own. And these people are not going to be able to solve these problems on their own. They need help. We all need to work together to get the help we need. Um, all right. So I'm shutting it down here because I'm way over my time. I appreciate your time and attention. And we'll move on to the next uh, speaker. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. In the interest of time, uh, Mark will be available for questions. Oops, I'm sorry. Out in the lobby here. And um, they have a... a uh, display out here as well with uh, some of the samples of, of some of the things you could run into, kind of give you some visuals. At this time, we're going to ask, um, I want to introduce Annette Rank. Annette has lived in Wisconsin all of her life, growing up in northwestern Wisconsin, but mm -hmm. lived in Madison most of her adult life. She's recently relocated to Jackson. She's a mother of three, including two adult boys, and she also has a three-month-old granddaughter. But tonight, she's going to talk uh, with us about her oldest daughter, Alyssa. Thank you. Um, speaking tonight continues my ongoing effort to bring awareness to the horrible addiction that took my daughter Alyssa's life. I've made it a mission of mine since her passing to do my part to inform and educate people about heroin addiction and the fact that it can and will take anyone. This vicious drug does not discriminate, not by race or sex or economic circumstances not by upbringing or religious beliefs. Anyone that ever tries it is at risk. It's an awesome responsibility to try to bring hope, inspiration, and maybe some sort of peace to others who have felt the same horrific pain that I have. I know that many of you share this pain, the worst pain imaginable of losing a child. Others of you have lost their sibling, a parent, or another relative or a friend and others yet still may be struggling with addiction yourselves or someone you love is struggling. Whatever it is that brings you here tonight, we hope you find some answers here. For those of you who have lost someone to addiction, it was most likely an untimely and unexpected loss, bringing tremendous pain and grief to your life. We all deal with these feelings and emotions in our own way. There's no proper way it forms from how we were raised, our past experiences with death, and our own emotional state at the time. I had experienced a large personal loss in my life almost 20 years prior to my daughter's death. I lost one of my sisters when she was 30 years old. 
I watched my mom crumble into only pieces of what she was before it happened. It was the hardest thing I had dealt with up to that point. My sister left behind four daughters, aged 12 and under. How does a person wrap their brain around that? How do you explain it to her children? There were so many questions with no real answers. It took nearly 10 years before my mom could even mention my sister Michelle's name. That was difficult for me, but it was how my mom needed to heal. It was not up to me. My path is different from my mother's. I feel the need to speak Alyssa's name and to talk about her and her life and struggles in order to keep her and her memory as close to me as possible. Yes, it hurts to talk about her at times. Yes, I still break down and cry a full day away because I miss her so badly. Yes, I still get angry with her and with the people who took her down that path of drug use. But then I have to pull myself up and bring myself back to this time, to my boys and my new grandbaby who still need me. They need all of me, not just a shell of me. And to my other family and friends who have loved and supported me in countless ways and to the world around me, still beautiful in so many ways. Alyssa was my firstborn. I can still see in my mind the moment she was born, her tiny arm reaching into the air, and that first moment when she was placed in my arms. It was a magical moment. She grew and blossomed as a beautiful and joyful young girl, enjoying all of the things other girls her age did. As she hit her teenage years, we began to have some behavior problems with her, but never found any obvious reasons for them. She was diagnosed with anxiety, but refused to see or talk to counselors or psychologists. It wasn't a, until about a year before her passing that she finally confided in me that she had been sexually assaulted as a teen. It explained a lot, and I was devastated that I hadn't realized it and that she hadn't gotten the help that she needed. I'm sure things would have been very different if she had. All that being said, before her addiction, Alyssa was a loving and wonderful young woman. She was drawn to nature and art, and I think of her in the beauty I see every day around me. She loved animals, and not just cute fuzzy ones that most of us like. She had a pet snake and a tarantula to go along with her kitty. She told me once that she loved the creatures that others thought unlovable. I remember being so touched by those words, thinking how selfless and sweet it was of her to feel that way. She had a very gentle heart. She also had an amazing and quirky sense of humor. She loved to thrift and antique shop and would find random silly things and make such a big deal out of them. She would take photos of them or maybe herself with them and send to her friend Mason in California. They would laugh and joke about them all the time. I have always loved wearing dress boots, and often the heels would make fairly loud clacking noises when I would walk, and she would tease me that I sounded like a hooker. I know, not a real compliment, but I thought it was funny, and I miss it. <laughs> she called me Maja. I have no idea where she got it from or why she started using it, but I sure miss hearing it. I miss her voice. I'm sure many of you have similar stories of your loved one, moments and memories that you cherish and keep close to your hearts. I have a box of her things, little things that she treasured or were just part of who she was. Some of her glasses, she didn't really need to wear them, but she liked them and had several pair. Same with hats. Excuse me just a moment. Same with hats. She liked them and looked good in them, so I kept them. Her coat, it still smells like her, and I take it out and I hold it close and remember how it smelled and felt like when I hugged her. I will never get rid of these things. I need them. I have her kitty, Nico. She loved him very much, and he is a great cat and a constant reminder of her in my life. 
he will, um, I think there are times when her spirit comes to play with him. He will chase something that I can't see dashing around the room looking up into the air as if he sees something or someone that I can't see. I'm quite sure it's Alyssa. I want to believe it, and so I do. When I lost her to the addiction, I didn't just lose my daughter. I lost much more than that. Because as all of us know, addiction doesn't only affect the abuser. It affects the entire family. It will crack and crumble any relationship that has a weakness. That was the case with my marriage. Dealing with the stresses and differences of opinion on how to approach Alyssa's addiction broke through the cracks and crumbled what was left of our relationship. He was not willing to go to counseling because it wasn't his problem. When he wasn't willing to spend the money to send her to treatment, it was the straw that broke the camel's back for me. I found a way on my own to get the money for a treatment program, and it was only days after I sent her there that my husband asked for a divorce. That was just the beginning of several months of life changes ahead of me. I would move out of the home where I had nurtured my family for the last 13 years to get a place where Alyssa and I could live when she returned from treatment. I had to change jobs in order to earn more income to support us and pay for the divorce. It was a lot to deal with at one time, but I had high hopes for when Alyssa would return. I had picked an apartment with woods, marshes, and walking paths behind it. I knew she would like spending time and walking there, but, I, but it also was not far from town, so she could ride her bike there if she wanted. I brought her furniture and all her favorite things and set them up in her room to make it perfect for her. It had to be just so, so that she would have no stresses when she came home, a safe and comfortable place to relax. The 40 days of treatment time was up, and it was time for Alyssa to come home. I was so excited to see her. I thought it would be a new beginning for both of us, a new start to the story that would surely have a happy ending. She would be all better, and her life would start to follow a more positive path. But I was very wrong. Heroin's grip was stronger than I had realized, and at the time, I did not know that. This is the reason we need to educate ourselves and others about its tremendous danger. We need to be there to support and guide the abuser, to keep them strong, and to direct them toward positive things rather than falling into the trap of using again. I lost my daughter less than 48 hours after she came home from treatment. I found her in a room, the one that I had so carefully put together for her, lying still on her bed with a needle on the bedside table next to her. I could tell something wasn't right, and when she didn't respond to my calling her name, my heart sank. I went to her, and she was cold. After not being able to wake her, I called 911. When they were on their way, I called my girlfriend, and she and her son came to be with me. I do remember still being in the bedroom clinging to Alyssa's body when Joan arrived. I remember thinking to myself, why would she do this to me? After all I've done to try and help her, it just didn't make any sense. I've come to realize that they don't mean to do this to us. It is the unfortunate circumstance of this horrible addiction. The rest of the day was a blur of police, coroners, and questions. It seemed like it lasted forever. It was the most surreal thing ever when they took my daughter's body away. Not the sight any parent wants to see, their child being taken away, zipped into a bag. I'll never forget it. Part of me is gone now, and there's no replacing it. I'm forever changed. What I've come to realize is that I can and need to function as this new person. And as this new person, I have the responsibility to try to help others by sharing my story. To help the addicted to see how this drug not only changes their life, but the lives of everyone around them. To help family and friends of the addicted to see how it is not their fault. How the drug has its talons in the addicted and how difficult it is to break free. 
but that even with this with this great loss, they can and must go on. To help the community and government to see what a tremendous problem opiate and heroin addiction is and how it affects so many people. And to make everyone aware of how easy it is to fall into the trap of heroin use and abuse, but how difficult it is to get out. This is our responsibility. If we do not tell our stories, this is just another hidden epidemic. We need to be an army of mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers, children, and friends converging on the government and insisting on change. What is being done now is not working. My daughter had OD'd several times in the six months prior to her death. She was given Narcan to bring her back to life, then tossed back out into the world as if nothing happened. Because she was an adult, I was not informed of these incidents so I was not able to get her the help as soon as I should have, and neither the police nor the hospital offered her any help whatsoever. When someone does go looking for help, there's no room in the program. You need to wait days, weeks, or even months for an opening. This is not acceptable. One day may be all it takes for heroin to take that person's life. More government funding is needed to increase the availability of programs and homes to help these addicts get on the road to recovery. We need to make everyone aware of this, and we can't do it by keeping our stories to ourselves. It takes public outrage to make change, and the public needs to hear our stories of struggle to realize what needs to change. Every person that knows your story is likely to share it with someone else when the topic of addiction arises. Your personal story may be the fuel that sparks in them the motivation to push for change. It may be a letter written to the government representative or a financial donation to one of the wonderful groups that work to provide education and support. Whatever it is, it's another person on our team, another soldier in our army, fighting for our cause. One person at a time, we can grow our army until it is too large to be ignored any longer. This is how we can make a change. We can help save the life of someone and spare another family the agony that we bear every day. Thank you all for coming tonight, for listening to my story, and for becoming an instrument for change. I wish peace for each of you as you deal with the struggles of addiction or loss in your lives. Keep your loved one forever in your heart, but also share them with the world. Thank you. Thank you so much for your story, Annette. Uh, at this time, I'd like to introduce Terry Bogues. Terry was an emergency room RN for 20 years. Terry grew up in Menominee Falls, went to uh, University of Wisconsin La Crosse for her BSN in community health education, and Carroll College, Carroll Columbia for her nursing degree. She is now a business owner of an event venue in Richfield. Terry would love to hear your story. Hi, I didn't come as prepared. I'm gonna speak from my heart. You've heard all the statistics. You've heard all the, how the kids get addicted. Um, they don't choose to be addicted. They, I've heard people say, um, yeah, they chose to do drugs. They chose to drink. They chose to smoke pot, but they're kids and, and they never chose to become addicted. Um, my son, Greg, was a wonderful, handsome, smart, talented, athletic young man. The type of young man you'd never think would be a, a drug addict. Um, in hindsight, I look back. I was an emergency room nurse. I took care of the overdoses that came in. But I really had no knowledge of how these kids started how they got addicted, how they even got heroin. Um, I had a little bit of an idea how they got the opiates. Um, back in the day, you would come to the emergency room and a lot of people would fake pain because they wanted drugs. 
um, either to sell or take themselves. Those laws have changed. And now, in hindsight, when I look, they couldn't get them as easily anymore. So a lot of people, kids, adults, turned to heroin because it was cheap and easy to get, almost as easy as buying bubble gum, I hear, you know, even in the middle schools. So anyways, I'm not going to go through all that. But Greg was a wonderful young man, and we got a phone call one day. Um, Mom, I'm addicted to heroin. It's like, oh. <laughs> so I immediately started looking for somewhere to send him. He wanted to get clean, which was the first good step in the whole process. A lot of these kids, adults, do not want to go to rehabs. They don't want to get clean. It's, it's a difficult process. So I found a place out in Utah for him. He was a very outdoorsy young man, a hunter. He was a hunting guide, went to school for that. So I found a place that did a, a rehab, a 12-step program in the outdoors, in the canyons in Utah, with nothing but a backpack on your back and a couple counselors. So he did all the right things. He graduated, and he went on to Arizona in a, to a sober living community. Greg was sober and leading the community, managing a sober living house for close to two years. He was doing great. He was so happy sober. He was saving other kids' lives. He was speaking at AA meetings, on and on and on. And then we got another shock. He called us one day, and it was about 10 o'clock at night. He said, Mom, I'm, I'm really struggling. Can I come home for a couple weeks? Sure, of course. And I even said, Greg, you're not drinking. No, Mom. Greg, you're not taking drugs. No, Mom. So we got him a plane ticket immediately, bring him home, and see, you know, help him and see what's going on. Well, he had broken up with his girlfriend, you know, someone I thought he, I think he thought he was going to marry. So, again, hindsight, we found this all out later. Within hours of the phone call, he died. He um, used one more time. I think, we think he thought, well, I want to feel good one more time. I beat it before. I can beat it again. I want to feel good one more time before I come home, meet the wrath of my mom. Not really, but, you know, and that's, that's the only thing we can figure out. He just wanted to feel good one more time. Um, and because they you you know, he didn't use for two years, he probably used the same dose that he did when he was using, and he, his body couldn't tolerate it. So for his funeral, I was very open about it. In the obituary, the pastor, when he spoke, I wanted everyone to know how he died. I wanted someone to learn from it. In fact, there was one young man in the audience <laughs> of the funeral, um, a son of one of the physicians I worked with in the ER, and he also had overdosed several times, brought back with Narcan. Narcan. And I told her, I said, please invite him to the funeral. I really want him to come and see what can happen. Um, 25 of the kids from Arizona at, from the sober living community, all came to the funeral, along with a lot of their parents, which I had no idea what impact my son had on this sober living community and all the kids that were struggling with their addictions. Their parents came, they came to the funeral to thank me for Greg. Greg saved their lives. These parents thanked me. So what I guess I'm trying to say is, these kids aren't low-life druggies that are doing the drugs. They can be your son or daughter. They can, these are, are kids that just go down the wrong path, not realizing once you take that step in the wrong direction, you're hooked for life. Yes, you can get sober, stay sober, but you're hooked for life. One time, you're back in the same predicament, the same addiction. So... They took a wrong, as the pastor even said, Greg took one wrong step, and it cost him his life. 
um, society, I think everything everyone's doing now to bring the awareness to heroin is great. I once, I spoke to a police officer at some facility where I worked and, oh, how is the heroin problem down in Racine? Oh, it's terrible, but we're weeding out the herd. I wanted to punch him. I was calm and started to educate him and then told him, my son, who was a straight A student, football player, baseball player, handsome, in musicals, died of a heroin addiction, or overdose. So it's good that we're doing all this. This is an epidemic. I hear about, if I hear about that Zika, whatever mosquito, one more time, and what, the, what an epidemic that is, they need to really promote the heroin. It's all over. It, well, you know, I'm not, it's all over. One mom I ended up sitting next to once at a restaurant, she said, oh, we moved way up north because the heroin problem was so horrible here in Cedarburg. And guess what? It's just as horrible up north. And she didn't know. And then I looked at her like, well, <laughs> so anyways, enough of that. Um, that's about it. I, I could go on and on. I do facilitate. I started a grieving moms group after Greg died. I had a couple friends who lost a son and daughter, not from heroin, cancer and a car accident. But I thought, you know, it doesn't matter. These moms, we need help. My group now is up to maybe 35 women, and 90 to 95% of us are deaths due to heroin. So that tells you what's going on here. The kids are dying more of heroin drug overdoses than they are of car accidents now, is what I heard. Um, so, but thank you. I appreciate you listening. and. We got to get rid of the stereotype. These kids are not low life junkies. We're not weeding out the herd by letting them die. Narcan is good. It's not going to make them keep using. It's just going to give them another chance to try to rehabilitate and live. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Terry. We want to thank all of our speakers this evening, Mark, Annette, and Terry. Um, at this time, I just want to remind you that the Hidden in Plain Sight exhibit is still open until 8 p.m. And this is an opportunity to kind of see a teen bedroom and just see all of the, the ways that they are um, that they can hide or uh, just all the, the symptoms of what you might see in a bedroom of somebody who might be using or might be addicted. Um, and this time, I just want to give you a preview of some of the future lectures that are in our Heroin Highway series on February 2nd. We'll be talking about the struggles of addiction and hear from those who have loved ones struggling with, with addiction currently. February 9th uh, is called After the Bar Closes. And we'll hear from those who are struggling with addiction themselves and the effect it has on their families. February 16th. Uh, celebrate reco uh, celebrating recovery and legislation changes made through the HOPE legislation, and then hear from a panel of success, stor success stories and their stories of recovery. Uh, Representative or Assembly uh, Man Bob G Gannon will be here that evening. February 23rd is a heroin simulation, simulated uh, experience where the nursing students discuss, learn, and demonstrate how to care for a person undergoing a heroin overdose and heroin withdrawal. The nursing students get a chance to understand how to administer Narcan, the reversal medication used for heroin overdose. The simulation experience will greatly enhance the education and skills these future nurses need to help their community with this epidemic. So that's gonna be kind of the, the topic that evening. In order to help our uh, partners best serve the community, we have a survey that's coming around, uh, an evaluation rather, as you leave. Detective uh, Mark Setti is available still for questions, and they do have, again, once again, they have a display you might want to visit just outside the hallway. And um, some of our speakers have agreed to, to kind of stick around if you have questions as well. Once again, uh, I want to thank you for attending this evening. I would also like to thank uh, West Bend Rotary Club, Elevate, Rain Park Technical College, and the Washington County Heroin Task Force for their hard work in putting this program together. So if you uh, have any questions, 
Detective Seti here. We have the displays hidden in plain sight. Thank you so much for attending and have a great evening.